in 2024 <laughs> update that you don't get notified in advance until you were joining a meeting. Um, exactly. Yeah, we are. I love how that um, works. <laughs> and we're climbing. Love to see so many people joining. Thank you all so much for joining this special workshop. Um, excited to introduce our guests here in just a moment. Um, please drop in the chat where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear um, where you are and hear who we're talking to. Um, welcome, welcome to the Saster and the Gainsight community. We are thrilled to have you for this very special workshop in collaboration with Nick Meta, founder and CEO of Gainsight, and Jason Limpkin, founder and CEO of Saster. Um, we are thrilled to be with over 500 of you from all over the world, Vancouver, Turkey, <laughs> Toronto, Texas, um, Paris, France. Wow, this is amazing to see all these people joining. Thank you guys so much. Um, we are really excited again to talk, have this special workshop between Nick and Jason. You guys are going to get a live view of a behind the scenes conversation that they've been having about the future of customer success. They're going to be going over their insights and predictions. Um, and the addressing the question on everyone's mind is at the end of customer success in SaaS. So, um, Nick and Jason both have lots of opinions about this. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Nick dive in to the presentation. We also will have plenty of time for Q&A, so make sure to use that Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen, and I will get your questions queued up to ask uh, Nick and Jason here in a few minutes. But Nick, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Excited to be here, Jason. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Appreciate it. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I just need some more customer success. I need a little more support for a few of my apps. So if you, if you, if you can help, that would be <laughs> good. That Other the, than that, is, a good is start that what's to the year. Is that what's happening here is we're doing live. I'm going to do live support for your apps here. The ones I don't know anything about. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I love, I love reading your tweets and posts about your vendor experience because it's very real. It's like what people go through and you guys are like the voice of SaaS, but you're also a company. And so you guys are customers of how many, how many software products do you guys use internally? You know, we don't, the, the, re, the reason it's fun to talk about it is because we probably don't have that many real products like you're talking about. We probably have 10 yeah. instead of 300. And so the yeah, issues still, are really yeah. real, right? When we don't get help, when we're mispromised, when the CSM doesn't show up to the meeting or presents misleading statistics or asks us for a 100% price increase with no discussion. Uh, <laughs> if, I had, if we had 200 apps, it would be annoying, but like they're yeah. mission critical. That's why it's so visceral to me since the beginning of Saster is, but it's our apps are our lifeblood, right? Um, so it's it's interesting. And um, and I think also, yeah. Funny. yeah. Well, I was going to say, it's funny because I mean, you and I have known each other forever since kind of early days of Saster and Gainsight. I remember being at the first Saster conference and was that 2015 or 2014? 2015, it was a long time yeah, ago. 2015. 2015. I remember it. I mean, you come such a long way. And I remember those early days. I mean, you... CS, your first exposure was your last with EchoSign, right? You guys yeah. had a CS team, probably very different. It's evolved a lot over the years from what that was to now. But uh, yeah, I mean, you've known CS in some way from the beginning, right? Yeah, look, I mean, I've been, that's why it's a fun discussion. I've been one of the, you know, a yeah. lot of the stuff has gotten, uh, back then in 2015, even earlier, 2012, when we met, we didn't have the data. We didn't know the NRGR of 115 public companies. We didn't know anything. No. Um, what I did know is that if the if it, trying to help founders at Saster, the number one inside tip I could give you is put a person on it. Yeah. Like, and I wrote twenty different learnings as a CEO. But at the end of the day, I, I, you know, too many folks weren't putting pe- great people on great accounts. And whether it's customer success or Frank Lutman Slootman's professional services or whatever, like you can't charge this kind of fees and and, and not put people on it. And once once I figured, so that that was really the point. And now we're in twenty. 24 and we're, we're because of a lot of reasons, including efficiency, we're rethinking this. Should I put a person on it, right? Can software yeah. do it? Or should I tolerate more churn and more issues because I got to be cash flow positive? Like, what am yeah, I going to cut, right? right? So, so I'm passionate about it. It's just the world has changed and uh, that's what we'll chat about. You have some great data. I don't know what the new world is, but it won't be the same as when we put somebody good on it, right? That, 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 that no. idea is still true today, but the way we do it is probably going to be different the next five years. I totally agree. And you know, it's, I mean, it's funny because even me, right? Like I am one of the voices for customer success. And yeah. so obviously I'm, <laughs> besides being a major Swifty, I'm also a major customer success fanboy. And um, I run a company with 1200 people. So I got to get look, we're profitable, but I got to get more profitable. I got to get more efficient. And we're like, we think about the same stuff internal. Even yeah. doesn't matter if you're the vendor or whatever you all, we all have the same problems, right? Everyone watching 
has these challenges. You want to drive retention, you want to drive growth, but you also want to make money, you know? And so I guess that's the real world. I guess we were in a bit of a fantasy world for a while, but this is the real world. I think we were, what I didn't realize, which is you'll go into the data in a minute. What we learned in 2023 was so many things, but one of the things we learned is as a function, how vulnerable CS was to cuts, right? I mean, there was some, you have some data, pilot put up some data that far and away the number of layoffs and CS was their highest category piloted across all their startups. You have more enterprise data, but I wouldn't have thought, I would have thought they bear a little bit of the brunt, but I did not think CS is a function because I grew up in an area where that would be the last thing you'd want to cut. Tough times. What we did, and I've written about, you know, what everyone really did in tougher times was hide in their NRR, as I said. We hide yes. in, in, in existing customers. So fire this. I mean, I don't mean I don't mean to be um, uh, um, less caring, but fi- it make, would make more sense in some ways to fire the sales folks or fire yeah. or do these other things. Why would you hire the protectors? But yet we learned the opposite, which we'll talk. We learned the opposite. We learned it was yeah. the most and vulnerable think, part of the team in many ways, right? And I think a lot of it is also the stage of the company, the size. Interestingly, like you alluded to, we have different data than the, the stuff you quoted um, because I think different segments. I mean, it's fascinating. Some folks know we're our majority investors, Vista Private Equity, who's, by the way, Vista's watching, Vista's great. <laughs> Just kidding. They really are great. I enjoy working with them. Um, but they, um, you know, some people might imagine, oh, private equity, they must want to not care about customer success. I'm like, no, our private equity backed customers are the most committed to customer success by yeah. far because private equity firms are like, hey, it's all in the recurring revenue. In fact, some That's of them are that like, yeah, new, that is new growth. That's great. But I'd rather have like smaller growth, but more profitability. And if that's true, retention is like the main driver of all of it. Now, customer success is not a panacea for retention, which is, I think, a legit discussion to have. But everyone in private equity knows it's about retention and expansion, you know, and so... Yeah, it's, it's fascinating though. Early stage startups, I mean, you know, people I love Frank Slootman as a role model, but there, some of you know he wrote this book on, called Amp It Up, and he has a whole chapter against customer success. Yeah. So there's kind of a, a healthy debate right now with different people, you know, maybe have a little bit of bias, but this would be a good debate. So can we uh, hit that? I know I want to get to your slides, but can we talk about yeah. that for a second? Um, yeah. Uh, I only skimmed the book, but I have also read a lot of folks at what at Snowflake have said and talked to folks. Yeah. I could be wrong, but my sense is, and this happens on on the social medias, is that what was said, what is distilled into a tweet from that was, and at the company, maybe more importantly, the company level, somewhat misunderstood because totally. Snowflake has a huge pro serve team and deployment team. Yes, right? totally. And we could talk about where whether that should be split from CS or where whatever. Put that aside for a minute. In my simplistic world, a really good perceptional service implementation team is part of customer success. Forget about world yes. reports. It may actually be in the enterprise. It may be the most important part. Okay. Because Correct. if you don't get that yeah. deal piled up and those folks deployed, they don't yeah. do. And so this, I, and so the idea that everyone should just fire their CS team and put it in sales because Frank said, so I'm not sure that's what Snowflake's doing. It's just, yeah. they have this matrix style org where they've got sales, they've got pre-sales, they've got professional services um, but they're just, there's just not someone without goals layered on top of it was his point, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, and we see that a lot where like people are basically like, you know, they want to um, drive customer success across the company yeah. and across their customer base. Nobody would disagree with the idea of retention and expansion is important. 100% of people know that's important. And then some people make the rep carry the burden or the services team or whatever. And I think there's some nuance. I will say, um, so I, I read the book. I regret it. I was like, I sh- I don't want to read this book because I know there's a chapter against customer success, but then I read it because the rest of it's pretty good. And it's kind of the GOAT all-time you know, CEO, right? So you should learn from him. And then there's this chapter on customer success. I'm like, come on, dude. Like, why do you got to pick on me? Like, there's so many other people we can pick a fight with. And I'm assuming it's eventually going to end in a cage death match between me and Frank Slootman. And my guess is he'll kick my butt unless it's like a video game contest. Maybe it'll be even. But like the thing that I try to take away from it is each business is different. And, you know, if you have a consumption-based business, there is more of a natural engagement for a salesperson, right? Because they got to keep driving that consumption. Also, Snowflake's got a business that's kind of a, you know, once you start using, you're never going to leave, right? Like we use it, it's great. And so there's some nuances to this where I'm like, yeah, that might model might make sense. To your point, they have services. Some customers are willing to pay for services. Some expect kind of like you were talking about Saster, 
expect the vendor do to do it as part of the subscription, right? So I think there are a lot of nuances. The only other takeaway I would say when I read that book and blog post, I was like, yeah, um, learning from St. Frank Slootman is like being a high school basketball playing and, and player and trying to learn from like Michael Jordan. Like, what are you going to learn? Uh, well, maybe <laughs> Jim Harbaugh, very, whatever it is. There's only so yeah, much we yeah, can take away, It's right? a different world, exactly. So yeah. for the folks that are not Frank Slootman, I think this will be a good discussion because there's a lot of nuance to have here. So let me give... I'll give you just a couple data points on a, a predictions post I did, and yeah. then we'll be able to go over to like kind of what you can ask you one more, not to get you out of loop. Yeah, it's so interesting in. on the yeah. Vista stuff. And for folks that don't know Vista, it's probably the largest uh, uh, P acquirer backer of SaaS companies at yeah. scale, right? Maybe Tomo Bravo yep. is bigger. I don't know, but they buy public companies. Yep. Anyhow, so they have all these great companies in their portfolio. And I was, I was catching up with Kyle Porter from sales off, right? Who's oh yeah. Part of Vista. Kyle. And he's like, totally. the board meetings now are 70 pages of data. Um, yeah. And he was kind of pulling his hair out a little bit. But my question to you is, as as one of the thought leaders in the space, what what what's one or two metrics or data point you learned from Vista for Gainsight sitting in those board meetings? Where How did it change your focus as a CEO, if it did? It's a great question. I get that all the time. And by the way, my experience, although Kyle is amazing and yeah, yeah. I love the guy, my experience has not been the same. Like if you look to our board deck, it's literally, you know, Expansion strategy, TAM, key hires. So okay, it's actually, it. for me, not not that different. But if you said, what have I learned? Um, I think the thing that I've learned is that eventually you can sort of build a model to show how you can create sustainable value in a company that's not just based on a revenue multiple. So cash flow, right? Like it sounds obvious, but for a lot of people, if you're only done startups, you don't realize over time, if you do it right, SaaS companies generate a ton of cash. So, you know, we went from losing money to now we generate double digit millions of cash flow every year and that'll eventually get the hundreds or whatever right and so i think the biggest thing is learning the power of the saas model which is kind of obvious but i think if you're in an early stage model you don't don't see that other side of the spectrum you don't once you get to a little yeah, bit more maturity and then the other thing that you learn is like what are the ways to kind of drive more enterprise value one of them being m a so a lot of these private equity firms are very good at growing through like more products to sell to your customers or more segments. And so we've done three acquisitions and we, so we have four products now and it's been great. And just knowing the math around those, which, you know, fundamentally for folks watching you, you might be selling your company at some point and there, the math is pretty simple, which is like, you're, you know, you're selling, you buy a company for X as a multiple, you hope for your company's value to higher multiple. You can pay some of that with debt, which doesn't cost you any equity. And then over time, you pay the debt down and you grow that company. And then you, you I mean, you can make so much money off it. This is why the private equity people all have like 17 different houses and private jets or whatever. They probably have done better than some of the VCs, right? Because the model really works. And yep. so those are the two things I've learned, like the, the, the how do you get to profitability and then how the overall model of value creation works. So it's like, I mean, you know, it's like, it's a pretty common next step nowadays for companies. Once you get to, you know, 50 million of AR, 100 million of AR. There's one door, which is you go public, but I don't know how the door, that door is not open very wide. It's like, there's a, I don't know, maybe one or two people. It's like a very popular club. Like if you, there's a bouncer there and they're not letting that many people in. <laughs> um, and like, you have to have somebody go out to, for somebody else to go in. And the IP, so that's the IPO door. And then there's this other door, which is like private equity. And frankly, it can be great outcome for a lot of people. So um, sure. I'm seeing a lot of companies looking at that now, so. Awesome. Well, we keep that free conversation going. I'm just going to share a couple things of what we've seen in the, like from my perspective. And then I want to kind of go back to a great blog post Jason did, which kind of basically motivated this whole thing. Um, so let's talk about, you know, predictions for this, the future. Um, and uh, I can only ever do predictions one year out. And usually I get those wrong too. So I'll say that with humility that, you know, these ones here, I mean, nobody predicted a year ago, chat GPT would change the world. So uh, but before we do that, we like to do icebreakers um, and all our things. So let's do it, you and me, and then let's have the folks uh, on chat type in there. So on the chat, type in your New Year's resolution if you've got one, or intention, or there's all people are using all these cool new words now. Like somebody said, it's not about a resolution or an intention; it's about choosing a word. So that so what's your word for this year? So Jason, if it's a resolution, it's an intention or a word. What's New Year's for you? Well, look, mine is, uh, it's probably, it probably could be the same one since 2002. Uh, but, uh, wow. it's, it's hire one more game changer to the team. 
Forget oh, yeah. the rest. Nothing That's else matters. Good. Nothing else. Once you add, once you have some scale, uh, when you're a gain site scale, or even Sasser has a brand, we have scale. We yeah. have scale. Not the same way, right? Nothing like nothing else matters. Uh, everything else is a band aid, and we have some game changers on our team. But one more. That that's that's where you get the magic, and there's a moment when you're one per you things are going you you can get a lot of crap done, but when you have like four or five magicians on your team, right? Then those are moments when you just you just excel, right? I love that, and it's funny because I remember. I mean, I don't know how many posts you've written about that or tweets. It's a ton, right? And it's probably one of your more common things you write about. And it's funny you can hear something over and over again, and it's just always true. Like More that's true. perennial for me too. Like I'm I'm hiring somebody right now, like um, you know, CPO or maybe head of it, you know, the, the product and engineering side, right? And it's like, oh my gosh, like there's so much more we can do. Now we all have the I don't know if you do, but battle scars of getting it wrong. And yeah. therefore I think some people are like, I'm not gonna hire anyone, right? I've been through those phases. Um, but I'm like, you got to, you just gotta keep even you if got you it. mess, I mean, you gotta keep it. It's probably up, at this level where we all get where just a pretty good person in that role, right? Whatever we call it, CPO, CTO, SCPO. Yeah. A pretty good person gets overwhelmed by technical debt. The fact that some of your app was built 10 years, they just, they can't get it done. Yeah. They're overwhelmed, no, even no. if they're smart. And and that, 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 that game changer though will come in and just, like you won't even hear about that crap anymore. Like it's just on, it's being solved. I love Nick. that. It's being solved. But that's the problem at your level. Hi, if you hire some CTO or someone that wears a tie and a blazer to meetings and yeah. isn't really a hacker anymore and doesn't understand, like everything's just too hard. Like ninety percent of the energy goes just to maintaining the platform, which is the easiest uh, uh, peril to fall into. Yeah. Scale, right. All the energy is maintaining. There you go. I like right. this. Except I do better. Do people yeah, no, wear, don't, don't lower the bar. Do don't lower wear, the standard. <laughs> Do people wear ties anymore? Is that a thing? I, that's a whole different. Yeah, you said you know, the blazer, I, the tie. I, I, I wrote. I wrote an old post about the tells that a CTO or VP of engineering is going to wear. At, and one of them is they wear a tie to a board meeting, and it's still true today. <laughs> it's still true today because I'm not saying they wear a tie on Zoom when it's the team, but they get like a great head of engineering or product doesn't need to wear a tie to make Nick and totally. Jason at Sequoia Capital comfortable. A great head of product engineer comes That's in and says, it. this is what we're getting done guys. And I'm going to increase yeah. velocity 50% and I'm making these choices. And if you want to wear a black t-shirt, that's a little scruffy around the edge that says gain sight at Saster 2015, fine. It don't matter. Right. But that tie and coat make up for the fact that they, they don't really know how the platform, the, the software and the platform works. That's such a good a total tell. tell. Yeah. And by the way, if they show lock up, them out the door, they show apologize up. to them because you hired them. It's not their fault as we agree. Right. If you make a mishire and uh, give them a, give them a gift card to Nordstrom for another hundred ties and thank them for joining. <laughs> well, if they show up at Gainsight in a Taylor Swift era's hoodie, they, they definitely get above the, uh, the interview line. So mine, by the way, is um, no last year wasn't outside of work was, was hard. And so um, somebody gave me this thing, which was like, Choose a word for this year. It's like like a hundred different words. One of my it's she had gone through some hard stuff too. And the word I chose was next. And I think it's an interesting one because it fits work too. Like what's next in SaaS? Like we have been through the craziness of 2020, 21, 21, 2022. And now it's like, what is next? Which is a perfect setup because that's what we're gonna talk about, yep. is what is next for customer success and SaaS. And so let me get mine. Um, so I'll say up front that like, you know. It's hard to know about the future. It's just happening all the time. Einstein has a great quote on this, right? But let me try. Okay, so five things that like I've seen. Um, love to hear maybe each of these. You comment, tell me if you disagree, whatever. So gross retention, net retention, I think everyone watching knows that those are things. Everyone also, if you've been running a business, knows the last few years, those have been, last year or so, it's been hard, right? Yeah. Um, what I hear from customers is gross retention drop for two reasons. One is, if you have an early stage company and people think it's kind of nice to have, unfortunately, you know, some of those things churn. And then even if your stuff is sticky, people were cutting licenses. They wanted a discount. They said, all of our vendors need to cut 20%, blah, 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 blah. And it's funny because we've had experiences where we're, so we're um, a, a customer of ours will be like, Hey, our procurement team has asked everyone to cut 20%. Now we sometimes are a customer of theirs too. And we're like, so do we get the 20% discount too on the other side? And they're like, <laughs> no, uh, we weren't we're raising prices, Nick. <laughs> exactly. And so I'm going to chart, you know, there's this, if you don't follow number one, follow on SAS is Jason Lumpkin. 
one of the top ones after that is this guy, Jimmy and Ball from uh, Cloud of Judgment. And he does this great analysis of public companies. And it's pretty interesting because this like tells the whole story of the bubble. The yep. net retention you know, went up a lot for companies and then it started dropping. And it, you know, it goes to the same thing. People aren't adding as many seats or whatever your entitlements are. And so this kind of free growth, it's still there, but it's not nearly as high as some people net retention is 100 now. Some have dropped below 100. What are you seeing in terms of gross retention, net retention in, in the industry? Well, first of all, looking at this fresh, um, dude, it's still 112%. Yeah, it's still not, it's still you're growing 12% so for when free. When we're, when we're yeah. talking about customer success, and this is the meta topic here, okay? We can't, even if you had a hard 2023, don't forget yep. the magic in this chart. If you if you make your customers even somewhat successful, you're going to get 112% revenue retention each year. Yeah. You don't even, like, I wrote up Elastic this week. Elastic's growing 100, going like 17% at 1.2 billion, yeah. and it's NRR's 117%. They don't need to close yeah. any logos. No, that's literally And their right. stock's they... up over 100% the last year. Their stock's up over 100%. So Whoa. if we want to turn our frown upside down, Nick, and this is the meta issue, is look, it, this is actually, and we're going to talk at a lot of things that are at odds with this. This chart says, and then I'm going to answer a question. This chart says, never stop investing in customer success for real. Never stop because if this was eight, and look, some folks had tough, like, you know, one of our favorites, Henry Shuck from Zoom Info, we can talk about him. They got yeah. hit hard, right? And yeah. I want to talk about why, if we get into it, they went from like 120 to 90 something. Yeah, um, right. But it's heavy scrutiny. Their GRR actually wasn't hit that bad. It was tech yep. and scrutiny. It's like, okay, like I will only want two and a half SDRs and 1.2 That's A's exactly using the product, which we'll right. talk about. But before, but, and, and there's a lot, and I know it's stressful for folks, but, but, for, especially for leaders and founders, take a pause if you had a tough one and look at this chart, get it right, dial it in, do more, for, build more software that's better, fill those feature gaps, make them happy. And like, you just, you just can't kill a company with 112% NR. That's the Vista learning. No. You can't kill these babies, right? So that's exactly right. And we're related to this. From Zoom he has another yeah. one. Jammin has another chart to answer your point yeah. that I love. I wrote it up where he also does something, this is really good, but everyone has versions of this data. His is just the, the best presented. He does a really good job that other people don't do, which he is, is he layers all the folks' new bookings ratios, right? Year over year. Yeah, I've seen those. And when yeah, you layer them, you'll see pretty much on average, Q2 of last year, of 2023, was the low point. Was yeah. the low point. And not that it was good on average after that, right? But but bookings, year over year bookings started to increase, right? That's so right. It wasn't that's just what a I decline. Of, yeah. yeah. So we're going to look back and I don't think 2024 is going to be like, like, you know, it, it takes a while to dig out of holes. If it's you're in one, and, and to be clear, not everyone's yeah. in one, not everyone's in a hole, yeah. which, which is a myopic thing. Great. But if yeah. you are, I think we're going to look back and say sometime around Q2 23, uh, it was hard to tell, but that was the low point and we came out of it and maybe 2025, I think will be pretty awesome. I agree. And I think one of the things I believe is going to happen under the covers is like in the bubble, people just gorged on software. Like they yeah. bought lots of products, but also the entitlements, like the seats or whatever, they just bought a ton. You know, for yeah. example, we would see companies where they're like, yeah, we have 10 CSMs today, but in the next three years, we're going to have 30. So well, let's just buy ahead or whatever, right? And you were saying this earlier, people don't buy ahead anymore and they have so much overhang. Yeah, that so was I Henry's point. 20, they don't buy ahead at all. 20, 20, they're, they don't in buy 2023, ahead, right? 2024, they're like, processing through that overhang it's like after thanksgiving dinner you're not not eating a little bit not eating after that for a while and yeah. so you're gonna have process that site so what i see when i talk to cs teams are like yeah we have downsell right now because the customer bought too much in 2021 and the renewals coming up they're like we don't need those extra 100 seats that'll eventually go away because that overhang of all that extra excess capacity will be gone and then it won't i don't think go back to 2021 levels but we'll at least get back to some kind of growth level and I think you and I are both old enough to remember the dot com. This kind of happened, right? Like people bought too much of everything in 2062, right? That mini SaaS crash, right? It was bad. Both of those. Yeah. Yeah. But I think so. so I think I think thing, there's two, yeah, but I think yeah. there's two things, Nick. I think one is lapping tougher times, right? That always helps, right? Yes. That was sort of your point. Worst case, worst case, lap and, and Henry made the same point. If you go through a year of, of downgrades and other things, like they're not, they don't keep downgrading, right? They, they've done well, it. And so you've yeah, got to laugh. Those. Floor. Yeah. So everyone should get a little bit of boost over the next year, right? That's in the enterprise. Right. 
But I think the point that people maybe don't get as vendors working at tech companies that I saw in my tenure at Adobe in a big tech company is like, look, there's only so much energy you can put into into cuts and app layoffs and everything. You get it. You can do it for a year. Like you get all the v SVPs and the VPs together and you go around and everyone's yeah. got to cut something and someone cuts like a beloved app. Right. And like the whole sales off outreach gong and you got hit because people had to rationalize to two instead of three. That's right. right. Yeah. But the, what people don't get, and, and 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 I think this this should inspire founders, is it takes so much energy to do that. This is not a five minute decision. Yeah. And as soon as there's even a little bit better times, people are going to put a little energy into that, right? But they're not going to spend half the time. And no. not only do I see it at the apps, it's funny. We see it. We work with a couple hundred CMOs and marketers as like sponsors and partners, right? right. And the amount of energy they're putting into cutting their marketing budgets, it's profound. But does that, yeah. is that going to help them hit their their commits for 2024 and 2025? No. No. The amount of energy it, they put in cutting their budgets, but you don't get any points for that at the end of the day. <laughs> no, and it's interesting because you can't cut your way to prosperity, right? You can't save your can't. way to prosperity. So but the energy it takes to cut a 50 apps and discuss them, right? It, you know what? At the, the end of the day, yeah. the amount of energy it takes – like, because Henry was great to share the data, the amount of energy it takes to go from 115% NRR to 95 at Zoom Info, it's so much work. You got to get the whole team around. Nick, do you are you really using it, Jason? Yeah. You, when times are good, you're yeah. like, F it. Like, I need 100 seats and I need it tomorrow because we're growing, man. I, I don't have time to argue over whether Elaine is fully using her license as Zoom Info. It's dumb, right? <laughs> so we're, we're in so this well mode, yeah. but it can't, la it can't last unless the no. we're in a global meltdown, which we're not. We're not. And I think that the key thing is like at the end of the day, software companies are valued, of course, on some efficiency and profitability, but also in growth. Yep. And, you know, if you don't grow, you will never be that valuable. And actually, like, um, you know, Byron Dieter, another, you know, kind of good friend of both of ours, had this good, you know, best around this good thing on like rule of 40, which for folks that don't know is that your growth rate minus your like cash flow margin or profit margin. And, you know, the, the idea is, you know, trying to make that kind of, you know, subtraction above 40. Yeah. Um, his point, their point was actually, when you do the correlations, it should be like your growth rate is worth twice as much as your profitability. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be profitable, but don't forget, like, I think we always over rotate, like in 2021, we over rotated towards doing everything we can to grow. And now we've over rotated towards cut every single Completely. thing you can, but you're like, we have to grow again. Right. And you're probably seeing this a little, people are probably too conservative now in some cases. Right. It's even worse, uh, you know, Nick, because yeah. what a lot of uh, founders were told, folks pre that aren't public, believe that like growth doesn't even matter at some level. Right, that's from it. Their VCs. Yeah, and that's almost it's almost toxic in a way that folks it all is. across tech and SaaS have internalized that growth doesn't matter anymore. Right, and um, and and even worse, then they go out to fundraise and they're like. Hey, I'm at 52 million air. I mean, the year before I was at 54, but we're cash flow positive. Can, can, you want to invest? Yeah. And they're like shocked yeah, right. when, when they get a no. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Nobody would want, you know, hopefully that company figures it out, but nobody would want to invest in that company. And I think that like, uh, what's interesting is having been through a few of these bubbles, like there is always this like kind of thing in the water of like, it's always terrible. You got to cut. Like if you remember in 2008, Sequoia had this very famous blog post called RIP Good Times, Rest in Peace Good yeah, Times. Yeah, I deleted it. And it was like, a, yeah, well, it's funny. There's no disrespect to Sequoia. They're great. But like, if you read that blog post and you bought tech stocks that day, you would have made a ton of money. <laughs> it was like, that was the, the bottom. And I kind of feel like we're at the bottom. It's not going to come roaring back. But if you're in a world where you're just like the next year is still batting down the hatches, you're probably missing out on opportunity you're missing or out. you don't have product market. You're missing out. One of the right? two. You're missing like, out. Yeah, you're missing out. Figure if it out. If you're and, yeah, so, I'll, okay. put, I'll go even further. If you're battening down the hatches too far into 2024, now a little bit we may have to do, right? Especially if you raise too yeah. much money to high valuation, we could go down a rat hole. Totally. But if you're literally you batting it. down the hatches, yeah. here's the here's the tough thing, Nick, um, and it ties to the, one of the messages in NRR. Like, you may have fallen out of product market fit at some level too. The world does change. It doesn't yes. change in SaaS in eight months or 12 months. But as founders, as CEOs at the top, we have to be religiously honest. Have, are we in product market fit? And um, 
our job as leadership in SaaS companies is to change the way business processes are done, to add tremendous, we forget to add tremendous value to organizations, not a smidge. That's it. And and if you can't yes. close any, if you have a brand, if you're north of 10 million and you can't close customers right now, you do not have product market fit. You do not have product no. market fit. It's a fact. It's true. And that's like, in some ways, this stuff papers over that. It's a good segue because the second thing I'm seeing is, you know, 2020. Three, there was yeah. a lot of focus on fewer vendors, you know, vetting like some, it's funny if people that have seen the movie, The Purge, like if you've seen that like horror movies, it's like the purge of software, right? And a lot of our customers, they'd have a spreadsheet of like, here's all our vendors and like rank, you know, one through N and top one or two are your HR, your Salesforce, whatever. But after that, it's fair game. What do you guess? Yeah. And, um, and so for people watching, it can kind of cut two ways. You know, you look at it, this is actually a great chart from our friend Godard at G2, where it looks at like basically how buyers, you know, as of last year were like, I want to have fewer tools. I want to have smaller, you know, I would rather buy stuff from existing vendors. Right. Yep. And so what that means if you're watching is if you're in a situation where you actually have a value prop, that's like multifold or multi-product, go get more people to use more of your stuff or buy more of your stuff. Right. And that'll make you way stickier. If you're the um, point solution startup, which by the way, many people are, that's how you get started. Then you have to realize this is like the tidal wave you're fighting. And therefore you have to add tremendous value. This is, I think the challenge in a bubble is you get a point solution that add, doesn't add a lot of value, but customers are willing to try a lot of stuff and they have budget. And now the, I think the bar is just higher. So if you, like you said, if you're not adding tremendous value, you don't have product market fit. You don't. Right. Yeah. And this is, I think, the thing to think about if you're a startup. Yeah. I do think though, like the Slootman thing, this 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 conclusion and data, I I think folks are taking the wrong conclusions from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, let's step back. What have what have we learned since that 2015 Sastra annual? Right? When no one had gone like box went public that week when Aaron came to 2015. Okay. Yeah. We have I remember, so much I remember, data now. Yeah. First of all, we've learned, roughly speaking, to get past 200 million in revenue, you've got to have a solid second product, right? We've just learned there's yes. there's physics of the number of there are exceptions. There'll be totally. canvas. We've had to do but things. unless you yeah. bleed into consumer, like okay, so we learned this. And then we learned that the best ones all figured it out. All and there's extreme ones like Datadog that where everyone buys eight products. Yes. Now, right. Okay. It's so amazing. yes. And we've also figured out that one of the reasons that works is we trust everyone, you know, Datadog's really expensive, put aside cost. You won't find a developer that doesn't, I mean, you'll find one or two. Everyone loves Datadog. The only thing a developer is going to care yeah. and say is my God, I paid 800,000 for Datadog last year, but I love, I love, but I love it. Right. Yes. Okay. But, but if you have to have worked at a bigger company, you have to have been on the other side of the table to know that in gooder, in gooder times, gooder times, Gooder times. <laughs> Gooder. The CRO and the CFO get what they want. And often this the 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 chief security officer too. Okay. Yeah. They get what they want. And and we're not gonna we probably won't talk a lot about security. The reason secu it took me a while to figure that the reason security is an evergreen category is the threats are ever new. And they are. if if this if security wants a new gain site security and they're convinced this will solve a problem, they'll get budget. They, that's, that's why security is actually one true. of the most wonderful categories because it, by nature, re there is budget in the enterprise every year for new vendors. Okay. That's right. Now, when, for whatever we went through, I, 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 I tried to coin this term that didn't take off. I tried to coin it the app layoffs of 2023 and, and app like layoffs. that's cool. I, like I kept that. saying yeah. it, it didn't, it didn't take off, but it's really what happened. There were app layoffs, yeah. which we, you and I have never seen in our history. We've no. never seen app layoffs because this 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 weird turn, I don't think it's a downturn. It lasted so long that we were able to go through waves, like multiple waves yes. of app layoffs. Okay, and it happened. But let me tell you, if if my plan, Nick, at some big tech company was, or even midsize, was to grow 50% uh, this year and I hit 70, I get any app I want in sales. Yes. You do not argue with the CRO. You do not argue with the CFO. And you do not argue with the CISO. And so, and if, and they will want their product. They will exactly want their right. product and they'll get it. And if last year they consolidated everything on Gong or Outreach or Sales Off, yeah. they consolidated on one, but you know what? Fine. But you know what? I like Gong as a standalone tool. As great as those pieces are in Outreach and Sales Off, I want Gong, Gong is better. Okay. Cause yes. it's all they, it's where they, it's not, it's not that there's anything wrong with their, with, and they're going to get it. And if they want 200 grand or 400 grand or 500 grand and, and, and it's, it's their app, they're going to get it. And so I think we're confusing the fact that you have to be 10 X better. As a vendor, forget about point solution. You just yeah. got to be 10x better. In general, that's a good point. And, and and yes, we went through weird app layoffs and we forced people uh, and we're confusing forcing people to simplify, which isn't going to last. 
with another trend of like HubSpot. Hey, they're doing 700 million in CRM. Like that's yeah. pretty cool. Or Datadog. That's right? amazing. Yeah. But, but I don't think that means there isn't room for other vendors. The Datadog HubSpot thing. I think that's where we're confusing consolidation with multi-product. I think they're different things. And we've gotten good at multi-product as so many folks are above a billion in AR, but that doesn't, it's not the same as consolidation. It's its like a cousin, but it's not the same yeah. effect. It's not bu always budget driven, right? I think it's a great point. I mean, I honestly might tweak the wording here even for myself because I do, going back to one of the first things you said, hire a great leader, right? Like hire another great leader. And yeah. when you hire a great leader, if they need some software, they get what they want to give it to them. Cause like, they get otherwise, what they like, you know, you're hiring a new sales sales leader and you're going to be like, oh, no, you're not allowed to use Vendor X. It's like, no, no, no. Whatever you need, just grow our sales. <laughs> if you need some <laughs> gong or which are all these are all great technology. If you need that, grow, that's fine. Grow our sales. I'm going to only judge you not based on your software spend, but your yeah. ability to grow. So I love it. I mean, in a downturn, people overreact to the negative. In an upturn, people overreact, you know, to the positive. So yeah. I think the third so one. So I guess the point is not, I want to keep yeah. going. I think yeah. we should just not confuse uh, multi-product vendors and vendor with c consolidation. I don't think there is. I think if you have, you have to have 10 X features if, until you're at gain sites level, maybe even beyond you got to have a founders have to have a 10 X feature in your pocket. You got to walk into that room that's and have it. something that's 10 X better. And if HubSpot doesn't have it in their CRM, you'll, you'll still be able to get that customer. They're not, this consolidation is not, it's only a threat to folks at the edge of product market fit. That's right. And the other thing right. is, if you're a younger company, you're serving the people that have um, real needs. Like, like in other words, yeah, maybe the mainstream. Why else would they buy like your buying. product? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're the people that have these differentiated needs. They're the early adopters. There's the innovators. And they have real needs. I remember like some Paul Graham post years and years ago. He's like, don't go after a huge market. Find the like small subset that's dissatisfied. Then you grow that market. Right. And, um, you know, if you're a small company, you know, you, you have the benefit that you don't need a billion dollars of revenue tomorrow, you need 5 million, right? Or whatever yep. you're at, you know? So as you said, as you get bigger, the second act, like we are in four products now, we had to do it. So the third thing I think is, you and I talked about this, things are bouncing back and they will, and they won't be like as big of a bounce as we all want, but um, they, the hiring won't bounce back the same way. I don't think this is just true for CSM. It just happens to be the world I live in. I think that people are not going to be like, oh, we're growing our company 30% again. I'm going to grow my team 30% again. They're yeah. not going to do it. But like we were talking about in the pre-show, they might have been growing their team 40% even if the revenues go because they're like, we're going to grow ahead. And I think you had a good way to say this. Like we're not, nobody's going ahead anymore. What would you say they're doing? Or we're hiring in arrears. We're hiring in arrears. Hiring in arrears. Right. That's a good way to say it. So you're, you're only doing it after the fact if you know the growth came basically, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. That's, that's I think huge. it's a good. I think data. there's a. I think it's interesting. I think there is this question of if things get a little easier, will we go back to the old ways? Which you're saying you're not. It was you know. I think I asked. I asked Iran from Monday at Saster Annual this last one on stage yep. about it, and he was great because because Monday was one of maybe eighty percent of the public SaaS companies that in in eighteen months went from negative margins to positive margins. Everyone did. This, I know right? it's amazing. Everyone yeah, did. What they and did. the way yeah. they did it was not actually not was they all paused hire. It wasn't really layoffs. That doesn't help. It was That's pausing it. hiring Pause for a hire. year. That's exactly. grow That's and don't hire. Yeah. You get profitable. It's yeah. really that simple, right? Um, That's the thing. I, yeah, SaaS is amazing that way. <laughs> yeah. But I asked him. Okay, great. You did this. Are you going to keep the discipline? Are you going to keep to these margins? He's like. We have now instrumented it across Monday and we are going to hire less than we grow forever. Yeah. Now, what, that's is interesting. It, and I don't, as, since this is a founder led company, Kosi, I don't, I think it's true. I don't think they Monday will yeah. go back. I don't think they will ever go back. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and I think that's a good, I mean, you, you look at it, it's funny because like one thing I think we all can do as business people is study like non tech companies because eventually like tech matures and, not, they'll never, it'll never be the exact same, but there's commonality. And I remember listening to a Procter and Gamble, with your know, big, you know, consumer package goods company earnings call or something, which is why, why am I listening to Procter and Gamble earnings call? You can, you can, you can question like what I do on the weekends, but Jason, you're equally nerdy. So I was listening to this call and they're like, we grew, you know, 6% last year. And they're like 7%. So more than the 6% was due to um, basically uh, inflation and raising prices. 
And um, and then they see we grew our earnings or something 15%. Now, how do they do that? Well, they're hiring less people and spending less money as a relative basis to where their growth is. That's what happens. As you get bigger, you get more efficient, you get more scale, you get more yes. leverage, whatever version you want to say. And so some data to support this is pretty interesting. Both the what I'll call like maybe muting the bear case a little bit, but also muting the bull case too. So this chart, which is slightly different than the one was posted that you were alluding to, this actually looked at um, over the time period of 2021 to like late summer 2023 when we ran this yep. on LinkedIn, change of the number of people in each of these roles. So 20% growth from the beginning of 2021. So there's like bubble and the downturn together and sales grew a little, little less. So what does this mean? Well, people did invest a lot in CSM and they cut, I'm going to show you the next chart, but they... In our data, they weren't cutting as much as that other data might have suggested. And I think the I difference see. is like our data skews towards probably companies 20 million of AR and higher. And you know, that other data set might have a lot of early stage startups. Probably. This next chart, though, is probably even more interesting. It, this is a little hard to read, so I'll just explain it. The the bottom is the bubble and the top is kind of the downturn. So the bottom is like different bars representing the year over year growth in the number of people with a CSM title on LinkedIn by company size. So, you know, you can see, for example, the yellow bar is like companies, 800 employees to a thousand yep. and you know, so on and so on. And so what you can see the like combined one, the total, if you look at 2021 to 2022, sort of the bubble peak, you know, the CSM population in the world grew roughly 20%. If you look at 2022 to 2023, kind of like the downturn, it grew basically 0%. And so what did that mean? Well, so of course, some people are hiring and some people are laying off. Some companies are doing well or not. The net was zero, flat, right? And flat, so what did flat, that mean? Like we talked about with Monday, flat. flat. flat and right. people that means people are grinding out because their big SaaS growth did not drop to zero in terms of revenue growth. So what that meant is people are grinding it up. They're just saying, you know what? We're not going to hire anyone. Take on more accounts or maybe tell the customer to go do it themselves. Like maybe some of your well, fewer customers get covered, fewer customers get fewer covered, customers right? get CSM, whatever. And so to me, this trend is not we're never going to go back to that. Like yeah. I'm growing my business 15 percent. I'm growing my team 25 percent. Nowadays, I think if SaaS gets back to growing, you know, 15, 20 percent, my guess is the teams are going you know, five, 10 percent. Like like in other words, people are going to want to get leverage, whether it's exactly that math. I know the hiring in people is not going to be the same as the revenue growth. Uh, but one one asterisk and dagger that it, I don't think I yeah. figured out until last week. Okay, uh, what is because that? we're all we're all watching everybody else on X and social media and everything. Yeah. Okay, the handful of companies I've invested in that are growing at twenty twenty one or higher rates. Okay, the ones are for the mo with one exception. I just put this together. They are spending like it's twenty twenty one. They're hiring like really? it's 2021. Do you think, oh. open, like, let's do an extreme example. You think open AI is oh, hiring yeah. like it's 2021? Yeah. No, okay. they should. So they every, should. every investment I've made, I mean, they're that hiring, is- they're hiring, C, they're hiring CEOs like it's open to the 2021. I know, we could talk about that. Here. But my yeah, point is, I, but, but there's a larger one. My point is everyone I've invested in that's north of 10, okay, that is growing triple digits, okay, that did not raise a multi-unicorn round, so they're fracked, right? They didn't raise it 5 billion, right? They are running their companies- essentially the way they ran them in 2021. And I think this is going to confuse people in 2024 yeah. because they're going to see for like, look at deal deal announced uh, this week. They're hiring a thousand people this year. Okay. Whoa. And, I, and I will bet oh you those God. are good paying jobs. And I will bet you yeah. there's some flexibility on attainment and there's some, and that the CS coverage is higher than it might be in a more mature, they're hiring a yeah. thousand people and the vibe at a deal is going to be a lot different than at a SaaS company that has decided to grow 12% this year profitably. And that, it will confuse right. everyone in the industry because there's this, by when we started in SaaS, Nick, we were all kind of the same. We all kind of ran like, yeah, some folks went under, right? But but mostly we all, kind of, the those of us that hit eight or 10 million, even that, but we all kind of were running the same playbook. We were growing a hundred percent, 80, 120. We were all, but now yep. there's this bifurcation yep. and open AI That's went from, right. from what? 10 to 1, 100 to 1.2 billion AR in one year. You can have a few extra CS yeah. uh, uh, account managers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty good growth. So so That's we're going to so hear well these said. stories and yeah. it's going to create ennui and it's going to create disillusionment and it's going to create bitterness and it's going to create quititude and it's going to create uh, a general malaise, which I think has infected us in SaaS and tech. 
And the fact that some people still are spending like 2021 is going to confuse everybody. It's going to, because it's, it's, it's at exact odds. Listen, here's Mr. VC on, on whatever South Park saying, oh, guys, don't spend anything this year, cut everything. But my hot company, do you guys need another 50? Because I haven't deployed anything the last year. You guys need another 60. Totally. You need another 80. And so they're getting radically different advices in these two, two boardrooms and people work at these companies and they're going to, there's going to be this, there's, there is an Island of 2021 of which open AI is the funnest example where every year I get a tender offer. Yep. Every year, every engineer can make a couple million bucks. That's good. Cause there's a tender offer every year. Like that's good times, man. <laughs> I love that. And you know, by the way, I think we all have won in this webinar because we heard you use on we and quititude. Uh, two very good SAT <laughs> words. So well done. I'm not sure okay, quitude is so, a real word, but we'll try to coin yeah, it. It's okay. It's all, we could use uh, all these words that SAS are kind of made of. So, okay. So the next one is, you know, at least from my experience, we're seeing customer success scale in different ways than just hiring CSMs tied to that last point. Um, yeah. Obviously there's automation, but there's also like pushing more to the client, which <laughs> clients may or may not like that more self-service, so to speak. And then more into like your internal go-to-market team. And this is kind of the, you know, salute my argument that like you should have more sales, marketing, and CS together. We're seeing more CS teams moving under like a chief revenue officer, not just yeah, the I sales this, leader, but, but yes. looks at the whole. Yeah, it's, hap it's happening. Now, Happened. just to give you an example of, of like pushing the more to the client. So this is Gong, actually. They have this, you know, great, you know, kind of self-service site. You know, they use some of our tech and some other stuff, but they have a, you know, ask for help, community, self-service, training. And I've seen people invest more in this. We have some products in this area, so I'm seeing it firsthand, where people are like, you know what? I want to do more self-service. I want to do more digital. I want to push more to the customer. And then I want to enable my go-to-market team to do more. Now, I agree with you maybe where it can go too far. And you end up in a situation where, yeah, I pushed it to the customer. I pushed it to my sales team. But now my customers aren't getting value and they're turning, right? And so that's like the, or they're not growing as fast. So I think there's a good trend here. And like everything, we can overreact and over rotate. And I think in some software categories, in my opinion, you can make the product great and you can have a great sales process and great self-service, but it requires change management in human beings. Like, you know, Workday is a big game site customer and we, you know, when you roll out Workday, it's like a ton of change management. It's nothing you got the Workday product. It, it was two years like, when I was at Adobe to roll it out. It was two years, right? HCM is a, a human capital management is a hard problem. You have to change human beings, how they do performance ratings, how they, all this stuff. And so to me, there whether it's professional services or CSM, there is a, still a need for humans to help companies deploy software, particularly if the customers are big. And so yes. if you're watching, like, I think you should have self-service. You should have digital. You should enable your go-to-market team. But be careful. Like if your product is requires change management, don't just abandon that because you're going to get a lot of shelf wear and churn over time. I don't know if you agree with that or not, Jason, but I think, this is the I, think, line, I, I, think. I think that, um, yes, I, I want to think that in 2024, more founders understand what change management is. But I think a lot of first time <laughs> founders or folks that or folks that went from SMB organically up market, they don't get yeah. What a big deal change management is. It is a huge deal. And if you cut back your what it, CS budget, perfect, whatever you want to call it, your post-sales budget, and do not implement world-class change management, if you don't get your customer, and if you don't measure it, okay, what is my goal? 80% go live by 30 yeah. days for SMB, 90% yeah. uh, go live in 90 days for enterprise, whatever. If you don't measure it across the company and do it, you're it'll be bad as it is. And it'll be even worse if you cut the function. Right. People, that's exactly everyone, right. Everyone, founders don't get this. And I'll sure tell you, sales people don't get at all what it takes to deploy the product. Right. They don't get that. It doesn't really matter if your product costs 10 grand, 20 grand, or 40 grand. If it takes a year and 20 people to deploy it, you're going to negotiate over price, but it doesn't matter, actually. Yeah. Exactly. It right. Doesn't I mean, that's matter. It. So it would be a real it shame if, if, uh, if we cut. Um, implementation, deployment, onboarding as part of this process. But what I have seen, I do not like, I do not like customer success reporting to sales. But I think that ship has sailed partially. Where where I have come around when I watch companies is there are many cases when implementation should report to sales if you have the right CRO. If and and I uh -huh. like it only yeah. when the CRO raises her hand and says, "Look, this isn't getting done right." Okay, I worked so hard yes. to close Gainsight. It took me a year to close them as a customer. And my CS yeah. team is all focused on other crap. And I need a team that is only going to get Gainsight up and running. That's it. And if they raise their hand, I think it should be part of sales without question if they raise their hand, right? But it's a, you got to own and it. And that's the key thing. 
And I think that's the difference between being a sales leader and a, a love sales leaders and being a true revenue leader. And I think one yes. of the challenges is you move this stuff under a sales leader who thinks of their job as the 90 day quarter and this other stuff's an afterthought. That's a problem, right? Yes. If you have a more like a true like GM president, CEO, I think that works. Last thing I was going to share that. Assuming they still like to close, Nick. Some... Assuming they still like to close. And see, they still have to close. Yeah, that job doesn't ever go away. I'm a little skeptical. So last thing you is I think in every, yeah. Yeah. in every category, we're all thinking about using LLMs and generative AI and so on. And everyone watching, probably you're building in your own products. What I'm seeing is the post-sales world, no surprise, is ripe for opportunity. Two kinds of opportunity. One is to like just automate a role, like support, you know, people are looking at that. But in the world of customer success management, what's quite interesting is there's a way to make them, uh, CSMs, way more productive, but also happier. We did this interesting survey where we asked people, what are the things you love about being a CSM and what are the things you hate? like the things you don't enjoy in your job. And actually, funnily enough, we took the survey results and put them into chat GPT. So the finding, I'm not going to read through them, but you know, no surprise, you know, people love things like building custom relationships and providing solutions, being strategic, da, 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 right? Yep. And so you can see this is a list of things people wish they did, and this is what they want their job to be. And then there's a list of, okay, what's your frustration? And it's things like manual work, updating data, you know, internal collaboration. And what I think is interesting is you can imagine if you're building a product in your own category, you have the same kind of list. What are the things that people love about their jobs yep. that you can preserve? What are the things you can they don't like that you can automate? And so I will say that the opportunity to use generative AI, we're doing a lot in Gainsight, but just in general, to do things like eliminate data entry or improve internal communications, it is real now. And so if you're not thinking about it in your post-sales team, you should be. And I've actually seen some early stage startups, quite interesting, where they're like, I want to do this right from the beginning. I actually want to like automate a lot early on. Not the human relationship change management. That part, you need a person. Yeah, But all of this other administrative stuff, I think you can actually automate a lot. So we're seeing more and more of this as well. I don't know, you know I'm sure this is well, like look, I, I'll 90% tell you what of I the think. pitches you get. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is what I would, if I were the CEO of Gainsight or was on the, the Vista board is what I would actually say is, I think it's even more than this. It's not just AI or chat GBT or GBT, GG, GGT. The fact that we aren't going <laughs> to rehire all these people in CS, the fact that yes. th this is becoming a sales driven function, the fact yep. that all these changes have happened means I think this whole category, I think we need more customer success software, more because we don't have the people. Yay. But- but Nick, it's got to be, we've got to remake the whole category from scratch. We've got to, it. it can't just be a wiki. It can't just be a crappy bot. It can't be like, if we're not going to, if we're going to replace people with software, we got to do it for real. And then it's yes. worth a lot of money. Okay. And just as, just as in our old days, you know, the early days of customer service software was all basically red light, green light, yellow light. And that was pretty great <laughs> in its own way. Right. Right. Now I think it's got to like it, someone these the leaders and and you are the number one leader you we've got to do even more because the people aren't coming back. That's exactly right. right. I'm AI, show you, it, like a, just throwing AI alone does not accomplish no, this goal. It's right? got to be part. It's just a tool. Yeah. So yes. I'm going to go to your predictions because there's a couple of interesting nuggets. I know we're basically okay. out of time, but you had this great blog post about like what happened the last 15 years. I think we hit a lot of these. I won't do the sales ones, but I think that what's interesting because you hit like you know. Yep number three and number four, efficiency, et cetera. I think the thing that's interesting is you overall wrote this as like the end of like customer success as we knew it. And there's something that new. If yes. you want to encapsulate maybe the, the summary of all that into like a couple sentences, what would you say the takeaway is for you? On the, the second point you new mean phase? Oh, just in general, the end of customer success as we knew it. And there's a new, new version coming. What well, is look, I think, I, I think I would tie it back to where we started and yep. um, the first conversation we had, the original goal, the original, look, we've had account managers since uh, the 18th century enterprise software. We've had oh. account managers, every industry <laughs> has account century. managers, you, you know, the, yep. the refrigerator company has account managers, People, yeah. everyone's got account. So this is nothing new. Like forget about what we, how we define AM and SaaS. We've always had folks that manage accounts, right? That's right. Um, and in fact, in other industries, we often get better support than we get in SaaS. We get better support at lower yeah. price points. Okay. So, so this is nothing new. Um, 
what what happened was, and so we took when we started in this SaaS journey, CS became that that account manager, and we would throw a smart body that cared about customers and that liked software. Totally. You had to care about customers. Nothing else mattered. You could have come out of any no. industry. You have to. You had to be that quirky kind of person that bleeds customer, right? And that like <laughs> and that likes, and then on the weekends plays with software. And if you hired her yes. or him and threw them at your top ten customers, like magic happened, right? Um, and that just doesn't work today anymore. That and that's where I was, and that's how I had so much success in the day. I think we all did, but everything has gone mainstream in tech, right? There are so many. Everyone graduates from college, and either they go work for a tech company or they start a company in YC. Yeah. When you and I, yep. when, even when you and I first met, even even like doing a startup was still seen as weird or quirky. It Going to YC still was weird, weird and, and quirky, hard, and, right? Yeah. And now that we're not hiring CS folks that are these quirky, nerdy software customer loving folks that just can't code. Uh, no, it's just normal people, normal folks graduating from college and normal jobs. And um, we, as we put them in the sales team, it's changed. We lack that that true champion of the customer. And I just don't see it as much in the industry. And I, I could be critical of it. And I am very critical, but I just think it's part of the maturation of an industry and the sheer number of bodies. Like you can't all have outliers in every category. Yes. <laughs> when you're when you're tiny I, in, in your company or in an industry, you can have outliers. Now we got to have mid packers and they don't always, they, and I'll tell you, I, I, I asked like every CS, I interviewed like 50 CS folks. I asked them all the last 18 months, like what percent of your customers show up to QBRs? Oh, 10%. Great. Yeah. Great. Oh, that's adding a lot of value. <laughs> I know that's it. And I think maturing is the right way to close out because I know we're up on time. I'll just say, Two things like we're going to send a follow the SASR team send a follow up email. One thing we're doing, which is pretty cool, is like a benchmarking tool um, that's actually like very, very data driven. You can filter on your company size or whatever number of accounts for CSM. And if you want to see some things we talked about, how they're changing in the industry, you can go, we'll send the link out to this. This will be great. And just maybe final thing, practicing what we preach of what you, everything you talked about, Jason, like we're evolving to be like more of a customer platform where it's about scaling through CSM. It's about driving adoption of the product. It's about building a customer community. It's about training your customers. So our own product stack is evolving. And I think this summarizes like what's happening in the industry. It's got to evolve. It's got to change. It's not going away. And I think you and I both agree on that, but it can't just be the same as what we've been doing because the world's changing. So I'm so grateful to you for writing that post, for having me here <laughs> Um, to everyone for watching, great attendance here, and uh, a lot more to talk about in the future. Cool. Yeah, great combo, guys. We had so much chat, uh, so many conversations, I so many people it. networking and helping each other in the chat, which is awesome. So we had cool. um, a ton of questions. So Nick, we'll be following up with you and Jason so we can yeah. get some of these answers and figure out some future um, post or another maybe AMA where we can address some of this stuff. Obviously a very important topic and really hitting home for a lot of folks. Um, but thank you both so much. And thanks to our attendees for joining. If you want to check out more workshops, just like this, we host them every single week, um, virtually in zoom. Um, and you can sign up for them here at the link for workshop Wednesday. We have a different SaaS operator or investor every week sharing great insights like this. So we'd love to see you there. And um, Nick, we may be having you on soon so that you can help address some of these questions we didn't get to. Um, but Sounds great. Thank you, Taylor. Thank, thank you, Billy yeah. and, and Jason, as always. It was awesome. Cool. Yeah. And I, I like that. Um, I hadn't seen the uh, benchmark tool. So let's look at it together. I'll, yeah, write, it up on I'll write it up on yeah. Saster too, because I suspect there's a lot of interesting data in that, even on the slide I saw, right? right yeah. Time. So I'm going to write it up. For, for sure. sure. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Thanks, good. everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks.